Well, good morning. Merry Christmas. The King has come. Amen. The King has come. Uh, well, good morning. Uh, what an honor and privilege it is for us to gather together on this Christmas morning. I know that this is uh, unusual from your normal Christmas rhythms. Uh, we, uh, I- I'm sure you have many traditions and you, you think back fondly at some of those favorite Christmas memories. So some of mine are uh, are growing up, uh, decorating the tree with, with, uh, with the family and my parents. This is back in the days of records. They had Alabama Christmas, and we would, they would put that on, and, and we would listen to Alabama and decorate the Christmas tree. Uh, all that said, this morning, yes, it's, it's different, but how good is it and how right is it for us to be here together to celebrate the coming of our King. And so, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Good to see you, Doug. Can't believe you made it. God bless you. Glad you're here. Hey, turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. We're going to, I'm going to, I'm going to continue a bit of where we were last night. If you came to the Christmas Eve service, uh, we, uh, in my sermonette, we, we looked at Simeon. And uh, um, briefly at just a portion of his scripture. And, and Simeon, an incredible story of, of someone who was waiting and praying and expectant of God's promises. In a time when, when you have to remember, culturally, right, they, they, were, they were discouraged they were defeated in many ways, right? They, they had given up on, is the Messiah coming? It had been 400 years since there had been a prophet. And, and the Davidic king hadn't been seen in 500 years. And, and so it's understandable that so many would ask, God, have you forgotten? Have you given up? And then, and then there was this, this man named Simeon that the Holy Spirit had told and given a promise, you will see my son, the Messiah, in your lifetime. And he was given that promise earlier, right? And so you can imagine all of that waiting and expectation. And then one day, the Spirit just says, today's the day. Today's the day. Go to the temple. And what did he find? Right? A peasant family offering two turtle doves, the, the poor man's alternative offering. But there they were. And he heard the Spirit say, this is my son. And he scoops up Jesus. And then he gives a prayer out loud of saying, now you have released your bondservant. This morning we will notice that there is another there in the temple to celebrate with Simeon. Listen to verses 36 through 38 of chapter 2. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanelu, of the tribe of Asher. And she was advanced in years and, and had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage. And then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, serving night and day with fasting and prayers. At that very moment, she came up and began giving thanks to God and continued to speak of him to all those who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. Anna was there with Simeon. Now, she has a unique, even tragic story says that she was married for only seven years. And then the Greek's a little difficult here. She either was widowed to the age of 84 or she had been widowed for 84 years. If she had been widowed for 84 years, she is 103 to 105 years old at this point, depending upon the age that she married. And Luke tells us that she was 
every day in the temple, night and day, fasting and prayers. 103 and still fasting. Okay? What a picture of devotion along with Simeon in an age when few had any expectation that God was going to move. Right? Either they thought God had long forgotten or our people are too far gone for God to still be with us. But Anna had faith. Hebrews 11, 6, faith. Hebrews 11, 6 reminds us that faith is of two things. One, you believe that God is. And second, that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Now, the most important detail of all, whenever we look at Anna, is that she was from the tribe of Asher. Now, does that strike you at all? Does that mean anything to you? Remember that there were 12 tribes of Israel. And Asher was the far north tribe, okay, along the Mediterranean, there with with, uh, Tyre and Sidon. Now, remember that Israel had been divided into two kingdoms. Now, which one remained of the two kingdoms? The southern kingdom. And the southern kingdom, after the divide, is called Judah. It consists of two tribes, Judah and the smaller Benjamin. This is why we call particular Israelites Jews because they were the southern remaining tribe from Judah. You see, the northern kingdom, those 10 tribes had been conquered and exiled by the Assyrians 700 years prior to the coming of Christ, never to return from exile. Okay, so they were carried off as slaves. They, they were forced, their women were stolen, and they were forced to breed out or be slaves or just long gone, completely forgotten, those 10 northern tribes, for 700 years. And for 700 years, God had preserved this remnant family. And here stands a hundred-year-old woman from the tribe of Asher daily in the temple praying. And she sees the hope of her faith, the coming of God's son, the Messiah. You see, God is faithful even when we are not. And God is working even when we can't see it. It makes me think of this famous clip from Billy Graham. I want you to watch this. Habakkuk said, Lord, please tell me what you're doing. And God said, no, I'm not going to tell you, Habakkuk, because if I told you what I was doing, you wouldn't believe me. If God today told us what he's doing in the world, we wouldn't believe it. Don't you think God's given up and God's abdicated and God's left the throne? He hasn't. He's still on the throne. And those of us that know him put our trust in him and him alone. I don't put my trust in Washington. I don't put my trust in the United Nations. I don't put my trust in myself. I don't put trust in my money. I put my trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. When all rest of it fails and crumbles and shatters. He'll be there. Amen. Boy, to preach like that. Good, good grief, that guy. Right? God is on his throne, even now, friend. And God is always working. And the question is, will we join him? You see, we sit on the privileged side of the cross. Surely we can look back in the light of the cross and say, I trust you, God. Will we be found faithful like Simeon and Anna? 
Now transition with me in, our, in your mind a bit as we focus on Simeon's pointed statements to Mary. Look at verses 34 and 35. Remember, Simeon comes up, he's excited, he scoops up the child, he prays this prayer of exaltation for everyone to hear. But in verses 34, it says, and Simeon blessed them, looks at Mary, right, and says to Mary, his mother, behold, this child is appointed for the fall and the rise of many in Israel and for a sign to be opposed And a sword will pierce even your own soul to the end that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. You see, at Christmas, we sing happy songs. We think happy thoughts. We sing peace on earth. But truthfully, we quickly forget that real peace isn't free. It comes at a cost. Right, imagine you come to me for marriage counseling and, and you say, hey, can you bring peace to my marriage? I can't simply say to you, well, think happy thoughts. It's not going to fix anything. No, rather, we are going to have to look straight at the conflict. We're going to have to expose it and we're going to have to make some difficult life decisions. And so here, In the happiest of moments, when Simeon has scooped up baby Jesus, then he turns and looks straight at Mary and says, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rise of many in Israel and for a sign to be opposed. Fall and rise, a sign to be opposed. How quickly we forget that the Bible has polarizing language, much less how often we forget Jesus' own words. Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. What What we are to understand is that Jesus is the Prince of Peace, and he offers everlasting peace with God. He offers the water that your soul truly longs and thirsts for, for all who come to him as king on his terms. You see, his terms are the dividing line, the polarizing standard. There are no other options And anyone unwilling to come to him is outside of his peace. Fall and rise of many, a sign to be opposed. You say, but who could possibly be opposed to the love of God, the forgiveness of God? Isn't Christianity good news? Yes, it is. But only those who need a savior will come. All others will buck in pride and self-sufficiency. I once shared how Jesus had changed my life with a, a friend from high school. I'd gone off to college and we connected and reunited. And I shared with him all that Jesus had done. To which he replied with a bit of scorn in his voice, man, I'm glad you got the help you needed but I'm good. I don't need God. John 3, Jesus explains to us the heart of those who are unwilling to come to him. Listen to verse 20. It says, for everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. See, to come to Jesus is to come to the light. Imagine like like a, a, a dark stage and there's a single spotlight in the middle. And there are all those who are crouched on the outside of the spotlight 
unwilling, unwanting to come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. You and I can understand that fear of not wanting to come in there and just feel completely helpless and exposed. But these are Jesus's terms. There is no coming to him without having the light shined on your sins. And those who don't come ultimately do not fear God. But instead, they comfort themselves with self-assurance and they say, nah, I'm good. But please listen, please listen once again to the good news on the other side. Because look at verse 21 that Jesus says right next. He says, but he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. Notice that it doesn't say those that come to the light don't have anything to hide because we all have something to hide. Instead, it says those that come to the light, they find that one's deeds have been fixed by God. You see, they found mercy. They found that Jesus had accomplished perfection, all of it for us, and gifts it to us. Appointed for the fall and rise of many in Israel and for a sign to be opposed. Secondly, this entails the exclusivity of Jesus. Notice how in verse 30, Simeon has been waiting for God's salvation, for what God is doing and not anyone else. This, by its nature, is exclusive. For if God is working over here, then all others are on the outside looking in. Make no mistake, Jesus was polarizing and exclusive in his claims. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one, no one comes to the Father but through me. You see, culturally, we put on airs with our sophistication and our tolerance. But the Romans invented tolerance. Okay, when other superpowers of the day, whenever they uh, had conquered enemies, they chose to Uh, enslave and exile their defeated foes. But the Romans, they tried a new approach. They said, let's adopt the other culture's gods. Let's adopt their gods. Let's make them ours also so that we worship and we pray to all the gods. Let's add them all up. It's all good. We'll include everyone. Then they can't fight back because we're all praying to the same gods. So by the first century, participation in worship of local deities and worship of Caesar, all of that was essential to the national pride of what it was to be a Roman citizen. Essential for work and to be a part of that culture, to love one's nations, to be a part of us. Insert into that the exclusive claims of Jesus. And you'll see the church being pushed out of society, ostracized, unemployed, their property stolen, and in some cases put to death, appointed for the rise, sorry, for the fall and rise of many in Israel and for a sign to be opposed. Look again at verse 35. And a sword will pierce even your own soul to the end that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. Even your own soul. Simeon looks into Mary's eyes. A sword will pierce even you. 
Now, immediately we think of the cross and a helpless mother who is unexpectedly watching the most horrific event that could ever happen to a mother. Don't assume she gets it because no one gets it until after the resurrection. And surely a mother has been pierced with grief and confusion. But there's another scene that I want to call your mind to. A scene where Mary gets it all wrong. In Mark chapter 3, we are told that Jesus' family was embarrassed by Jesus' claims and all the attention that he was getting from leaders in Jerusalem. (laughs) You see, the leaders opposed him. His teaching was unorthodox. Why is he ministering to the lower class? They would, they, they would throw all sorts of accusations. He's demon-possessed. Now, amidst all of this controversy, in Mark chapter 3, verse 21, tells us that his family had thought that he had lost his senses. In verse 31, tells us that his mother and brothers arrived where he was teaching in order to pull him out of the crowd, presumably to get him help. Like, let's stop this. See, a sword pierced Mary's soul as she experienced the narrow road of Jesus against culture. Isn't it fascinating that Mary is not excluded? And neither are you. The divide of Jesus, it isn't always outward. Most of the time, the divide that occurs is inward. Because to follow Jesus is to realize that we have been bought with a price. and That we are no longer our own. Or as Jesus puts it in Luke 9, 23, anyone who wishes to come after me must deny himself and daily pick up his cross. This means that the Christian life is to continually deal with the inner conflict of repentance. Like Mary, you and I many times will get things wrong and a sword will pass through your own heart forcing you to humble yourself again and again at the foot of the cross. To quote Tim Keller, like antiseptic on a wound, repentance stings, but then it heals. Beloved, when was the last time that you were in a season of fighting to get things out of your life because King Jesus has convicted you? on what you spend your money, on what you watch on TV, on how much time you waste on social media, on how you turn to food or alcohol as an escape. How long has it been? Now, I'm certainly not asking you to stir up your own guilt, but a reasonable man would admit you're not a finished product. And it is certainly possible for all of us to turn down the knob of conviction of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So it is well within bounds for me to ask you, when was the last time that Jesus' words pierced your soul? When I think about living the life of repentance, there is a particular scene in one of C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia where there is, there is a boy named Estes Scrub. All right, he was selfish, he was immature, he only thought of himself. Now, one day he's on this voyage and he finds himself within a dragon's lair. And he's been there long enough that he looks down and discovers that he himself has turned into a dragon. Now he attempts to remove the scales, but he cannot by himself. But then finally, Aslan, the lion, who is the Christ figure, shows up. Listen, as Aslan Aslan speaks, he says, 
You will have to let me undress you. Eustace says, I was afraid of his claws, I can tell you. But I was pretty nearly desperate as I lay flat on my back to let him do it. The very first tear that he made was so deep, I thought it was going, going right to my heart. And then he began pulling the skin off. And it hurt worse than anything I had ever felt. The only thing that made me able to bear it was the pleasure of feeling the stuff peel off. You see, that's how repentance is with you and I. We would rather do it ourselves, but we cannot. And even if we could, we would not remove what really has to go. You see, the truth is, what is noble and what is attractive in us has come from the cutting that we would have avoided. I have found that to walk with Christ is to at times look down and see again scales and then to ask him kindly to use his claws to remove them. Finally, the sword that pierces our soul isn't simply one of repentance, it is also one of surrender. An acknowledgement that his ways are best, even if they seem opposite much of the time. As Mary stood trembling before the cross, what would you say to her? Don't you long to comfort her and remind her, listen, he will turn all of this for good. To surrender is to remember that so much of life is out of our control. We may plan our way, but the Lord orders our steps. As a trained horse who no longer chooses his own path, but has learned to trust the master, we too with each step must learn to follow the Savior's lead. And with each pierce of the sword, a mature Christian surrenders even more because he's found that there is abundant life on the other side. Amen. There's a post I saw on Facebook the other day from a dear friend of mine from seminary. It is incredibly moving. I'm going to tell you that up front, but I want to share it with you. You see, back in 2018, he was driving his family to church when an oncoming van struck their vehicle, killing his wife and one of his two young daughters. You see, his family of four in an instant was cut in half. Almost five years on the other side, he posted this question. Knowing what I know now, would I still drive to church that night of January 2018? Pause and consider those five years. The sadness of losing his wife and one of his daughters. The inadequacy he feels raising his daughter as a single dad. Not to mention the physical therapy the years that it took for him to recover. Knowing what I know now, would I still drive to church that night? This is his answer, not mine. Yes, I would. Because car crashes along the path of obedience to Christ serve my good and the glory of God, and especially those that happen while driving my family to church. Then he ended with, oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. You say, Pastor, why would you share such a message like this at Christmas? The reality is, is we do have hope because our God has come. 
Our God has come as our savior and as our king and as our redeemer. But he has also come to change you, to make you look like him. He's offered you resurrected life. Life that is able to overcome the trials, the hills, and the valleys of real life. He's offered you a hope that is lasting, that is sure, that is greater than anything offered this side of eternity. Eternal life, salvation, to know him, to walk with him. That's our hope and our celebration this Christmas. And those of us that know him, even though his sword pierces our soul, we know it's for our good and we trust him. Would you pray with me? Our heavenly father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this Christmas day, for the celebration of life and the giving of your son, the king, the king has come. Thank you, King Jesus. Thank you for all that you have done, for going to the cross, for living your entire life in obedience to the father, selflessly, completely obedient, all for the glory of God and on our behalf so that we could know you and we could have life. But you didn't stop there. You give us your spirit and you give us your resurrected life. You give us fellowship. And you even give us forgiveness in the midst of when we, can, when we still mess up, when we still make mistakes, your love and your favor that is towards us, it never wavers. And we thank you for that. We rejoice in that truth this Christmas morning. Thank you for that hope. Father, if there's anyone here that does not know you, I pray that they would hear your words of life, that they would come to you, that you would give them faith, God, that you would open their eyes. We pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen.